to present in this seminar series. You know, I looking at the the list of speakers, they're all fabulous microbiologists, some of which I know, some of who I just know by reputation, and it, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be among this this illustrious group. I noticed in in the the seminar titles that there were some people talking about extremophiles, and I'm going to continue on that thread and talk about a different kind of extremophile. Um, I'm going to talk about big bacteria, focusing primarily on uh, the big bacterium that my laboratory studies, but I'm going to try to bring in some information from other organisms as well. So my laboratory studies two groups of intestinal bacteria. Um, our model organisms are Epilopysium species type B, which is a large bacterium that's found in the intestinal tract of the surgeon fish Nasotonganus. We also study Metabacterium polysporo, which is a, a large bacterium that's found in the gastrointestinal tract of guinea pigs. We like to study these two groups because learning a little bit about um, the, the symbiotic association in one system oftentimes informs the other system. And we're also interested in the cell biology of these organisms. If you look at these two micrographs, you can see that there are some really gross morphological features that the two groups share. And that's the production of multiple intracellular bodies. In the metabacterium image, you can see these four phase bright objects. And in Epilopysium, you can see these two large structures internally. Those are offspring, and we've been interested in where this, this unusual form of um, reproduction evolved from. So I'm going to start my talk out to... Sorry to interrupt you. Can we do a can you do full screen? We study two groups of intestinal bacteria, and today I'm going to focus primarily on talking about members of the genus Epilopysium, which are surgeon fish intestinal symbionts, and primarily talk about Epilopysium type B, which is our model organism for studying these large bacteria. I'll tell you a little bit about Metabacterium polyspora as well. So I'd like to start by giving you an introduction to these organisms in case some of you don't know Epilopysium or Metabacterium and tell you a little bit about their discovery, their initial characterization. So Epilopysium um, was first described in, by a group of fish biologists who were studying surgeon fish in the Red Sea, including the brown surgeon fish, Acanthorus nigrofuscus. When they opened up the intestinal tract of these bacteria and, and looked inside, they saw some pretty amazing large microorganisms. Th this is a, a short movie that I'd like to show you uh, that shows you the, um, what you might see if you took a little bit of gut fluid from a surgeon fish and put it on a microscope. This was just shot with a, a regular old commercial, you know, consumer grade Canon camera held up to an eyepiece of a Zeiss microscope. Um, using a 10x objective. And what you might see is uh, rolling around in the fluid, swimming through the fluid channels that were formed between the cover slip and the, the slide are these large microorganisms um, swimming along pretty happily. Um, but they're enormous and in parts of the gut they're, they're pretty much the, the dominant biomass of the intestinal system. Individuals of this group of microbes can reach tremendous lengths, um, su such as this individual, which was 600 microns in length. They also exhibit a number of unusual features, including the production of multiple internal structures. In this particular individual, I hope you can see that there's one structure here and a second structure there. Those are offspring cells or daughter cells. Offspring are initiated in the tips of a mother cell. They grow inside the cytoplasm of the mother cell, and eventually they burst out. These are two Nomarski differential interference contrast micrographs showing offspring emerging from a mother cell. And I hope you can see this tear in the mother cell envelope, and the offspring cell is arching its way out of that tear. And then this cell is just a slightly later stage of the process. This group of large microorganisms exhibited a number of features that appear to be unique and didn't fit in, in some of the classically described morphologies of, of protozoa. So Lynn Montgomery and Peggy Pollack described this organism in a, a, a publication that came out in the Journal of Protozoology in 1988, and they gave this group of, of organisms the name Epilopysium fischelsoni. 
Epilopisium means guest at a banquet of a fish. About the time that these publications started emerging about Epilopisium, Kendall Clements, who was a graduate student at James Cook University in Australia, studying reef fish and their nutritional ecology, he was curious whether or not he could find similar microbes in the intestinal tract of some of the, the tropical fish that he was looking at. So he did an extensive survey looking at and classifying microorganisms found in the intestinal tract of a variety of different reef fish based on their morphology. So he, he found a number of different ciliates and flagellates, but then he found this group of large microbes similar to Epilopisium that he grouped into 10 morphotypes based on their overall cell shape, their size, and their mode of cellular reproduction. And he published that, that survey in 1989 in marine biology. This next slide just summarizes the results of what Kendall saw. He looked most extensively in other surgeon fish. The, the surgeon fish family has about a little over 80 known species that have been described. And that family is, is, is divided into multiple genera. He looked at, at members of all of the, the, the genus, the genera of surgeon fish, and found that there were a number of these large microbes in the intestinal tract of um, members of the Acanthorus species, such as Acanthorus nigrofiscus that I showed earlier. He also found them in Tinochetus species, Naso species, Zebrasoma species. But he didn't find them in all members of a particular genus of surgeon fish. For example, this, this guy down in the lower left-hand corner is also an Acanthorus species, but it doesn't harbor these large intestinal microbes. Kendall found that these microbes, which are shown here, this is sort of the variety of, of microbes that you can find in surgeon fish guts. Um, these are all micrographs shown at the same magnification. The amorphotype that, that Kendall described would be a rep represented by that earlier slide of the, the large epilo that practically filled the screen. If it was on this particular slide, it would fill the, pretty much fill the, the, the screen as well. The second largest morphotype is the B morphotype that we study. These guys get to be about 300 microns in length and don't exhibit any, any uh, evidence of binary fission and instead rely on multiple internal offspring formation for reproduction. There are also a number of smaller morphotypes that don't appear to use binary fission, but some filamentous types as well that do show evidence of binary fission here, and I, I hope you can see it here as well. So he found these large microbes associated with surgeon fish, primarily surgeon fish that were eating a lot of algae, eating a lot of detritus, or, or surgeon fish that were omnivores. So he expanded his survey to look at other herbivorous reef fish that were feeding side by side with surgeon fish on the reef, um, members of uh, the, the rabbit fish family, ciganids, and the parrot fish family, the scarids, he never found these large microbes in their intestinal tract. So it appeared to be a very specific symbiosis between these large microbes and um, their surgeon fish hosts. However, with, with the unusual complement of characteristics seen in these microorganisms, their large cell size, their unusual mode of reproduction, and maybe a less obvious feature, their, their motility very similar to ciliates. However, these cells don't have cilia on their surface. Instead, of, they are covered with fine filaments that look more like bacterial flagella. So with this unusual complement of characteristics, it was unclear where Epilopisium or these other large microbes fit in a larger phylogenetic context. This is probably a familiar tree for most of the people watching today. This is a phylogenetic tree based on small subunit ribosomal RNA sequence comparisons. From these types of analyses, we know that extant life forms, cellular life forms, fall in three major domains, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. So it was unclear if Epilopisium was in fact a eukaryotic microbe, if it was a bacterium, or if it was something totally unique to biology. This is about where I came in on the scene. 
So I was a, a, a graduate student at Indiana University and when I asked to join Norm Pace's lab, he just happened to have some surgeon fish gut contents in his refrigerator um, that had been sent to him by Kendall Clements. So he pulled some of those samples out, we looked at them under the microscope and he said, hey, how about if you work on these organisms? And um, little did I know at the time that it would become kind of a lifelong obsession for me. So what, I, what my task was to, to, was to take gut contents, surgeon fish gut contents that were fixed in ethanol and shipped off to Indiana and my task was to get some phylogenetically relevant information from these enormous gut microbes without first having to devise a means of growing them in the laboratory. At the time it was kind of challenging but these methods have become routine and lots and lots of people are doing this now so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail just to say that for my initial analyses I focused on the two largest morphotypes, the A and B morphotypes. I would get contents like this and pick out individual cells from these mixed gut contents, transfer the cells through wash solutions and whenever I'd gathered a few thousand cells I would lyse them and use PCR amplification to to amplify the small subunit ribosomal RNA genes in that sample. When I started getting sequence information back from those amplicons, from those clones of amplicons, I found that the, the sequences I was obtaining looked bacterial in nature and despite coming from different gut contents they were very similar in sequence. From the amorphotype I was getting two groups of, of phylogenetically related sequences and from the B morphotype cells I was getting a single sequence. This was a really exciting result seeing these large organisms were nestled right in among the bacteria but it was also a little bit unnerving because of the samples I was starting with. We know that um, it, it would be entirely possible that I was picking up some other bacterium that was living in the gastrointestinal tract and maybe just attached to the surface of these large cells and maybe that's what I was picking up at the end of my processing. So I needed a, a way to confirm that the sequences I was obtaining were in fact coming from Epulopycium. And I did that using fluorescence in situ hybridization. I would take the sequences from these putative Epulopycium sequences and look for regions that were signatures for this group. Parts of the ribosomal RNA gene that were unique to these putative Epulopycium sequences and not found in other sequences in the database. I then designed oligonucleotide probes that would be complementary to the ribosomal RNA labeled them with fluorescein and then went back in gut contents and hybridized with those probes. And what I found was that those probes would specifically light up the ribosomes contained within Epulopycium cells, which confirmed that these sequences were in fact coming from Epulopycium and not some other bacterium. That allowed me to place Epulopycium in that larger phylogenetic framework, specifically in the bacteria in the low GC gram-positive bacteria phylum Formicides, and specifically related to members of the genus Clostridium. So if I zoom in on this region of the tree, this is the kind of phylogeny that I, I was generating from those sequences. Here are the two different clusters of sequences that I was getting from the A morphotype cells and the single cluster that I got from the B morphotype cells. Since this initial description We've gone on to look at other of those large bacteria symbionts of surgeon fish and found that using fish um, we could confirm that those different morphotypes that Kendall originally described form a coherent clade within the low GC gram-positive bacteria. Okay, I'm going to transition now and tell you a little bit about Metabacterium polyspora which is our another model organism that my laboratory studies um, for maybe some obvious reasons. We were, Metabacterium polyspora was introduced to me by um, Carl Robineau who had studied the DNA of Metabacterium polyspora back in the 50s and he said this is a really interesting organism, looks very similar to your Epulopycium, maybe you should study it as well and, and I totally agreed. So Metabacterium polyspora it was first described in 1913 by Edward Chaton and Charles Perard. 
it's a, a large bacterium, not quite as large as those giant epilos, but cells can reach lengths of 12 to 35 microns. This bacterium has the unusual ability to produce as many as nine endospores per mother cell. This image is a phase contrast micrograph of the cecum contents of a guinea pig. And you can see all of these large cells with multiple phase bright endospores, as well as some of these large cells that are just simply phase bright. Those are all metabacterium cells. Metabacterium bears a striking resemblance to some of the smaller epilos, um, such as the type F epilo that's found in the surgeon fish Acanthus olivaceus. It's a fairly large cell, 15 to 60 microns long, and it was described as having the ability to produce as, seven, as many as seven internal daughter cells. So again, when I was a grad student, my, my task here was to see whether or not this morphological similarity between the F morphotypes or epilos and their daughter cell formation and some of these metabacterium were reflecting an evolutionary relationship between these groups of organisms. Again, we can't grow metabacterium in pure culture, so I used some differential centrifugation methods to enrich for, for metabacterium. I lysed them, used fish to confirm the source of the sequences that I obtained, and that allowed me to place metabacterium in this phylogenetic context. And in fact, metabacterium is one of the closest known relatives of the Epilopycium group. This was one of those aha moments and, and led to the hypothesis that internal offspring formation that was observed in Epilopycium may have arose from endospore formation. Other members of this group, of this particular clade, include Clostridium lenticellum and an, a Clostridium called strain PS7. These are pretty typical looking clostridia. They're one to four microns in length and they have the ability to produce a single dormant endospore. So my lab has been working towards trying to figure out how much of sporulation is conserved in Epilopycium and whether or not sporulation mechanisms are used to produce live internal offspring. What we use as the basis of our comparisons are the, the decades of information that have been gathered from research on the model organism Bacillus subtilis. Bacillus subtilis is a, a soil bacterium that has the ability to produce an endospore. It's a fantastic genetic system and it's been extensively studied. I like to think of Bacillus subtilis as having two alternative lifestyles. When nutrients are plentiful and conditions are good, Bacillus subtilis can replicate its genetic material. It grows to about twice its starting size. It segregates that material into the two halves of the cell, and the cell divides. It continues this vegetative life cycle using binary fission for reproduction until conditions take a turn for the worse. When nutrients become limiting, Bacillus subtilis can cash in its chips. It can go through a developmental process to produce a highly resistant dormant cell, an endospore. In this case, Bacillus subtilis is, is starving for nutrients. One of the first things it does after it replicates its genetic material is it clamps down on the replication origins and prevents any additional chromosome replication from occurring. The cell then divides asymmetrically, producing a small cell called the four spore and a larger mother cell. As development progresses, that smaller cell is fully engulfed by the larger mother cell, eventually pinching it off as a free protoplast within the mother cell. At this stage, there's one chromosome copy within the four spore and another chromosome copy is retained in the mother cell. Through the coordinated expression of genes in both of these chromosomes, that internalized cell is prepared for dormancy. Sporulation-specific proteins are produced, spore-specific peptidoglycan, the cortex is produced, and through um, the developmental process, the cell becomes very dehydrated, ATP content decreases, and eventually, the mother cell lyses, releasing this mature dormant endospore. 
In this state, the cell can wait out those nutrient-deprived conditions for, for days or weeks, years, decades. Some people even say a million years, although I'm not really confident in the data about on those uh, lengths of times. Although, I do believe that you can, can that endospores can survive for decades and, and even hundreds of years. Even though this is a dormant cell, it still has the ability to sense changes in the environment. On the surface of the, the cell membrane are receptor proteins that are specifically designed to, to detect germinants, which are usually things like amino acids, nutrients that, that can support the growth of Bacillus subtilis. When those nutrients are sensed, this cell becomes reanimated. It rehydrates, it outgrows from the spore core, for, or sorry, from the coat, and it can re-enter this vegetative life cycle. So you can imagine with Epilopysium, we think that this process probably occurs, but instead of becoming a dormant internal cell, if you stopped at this stage and allowed the internal cell to grow, you would essentially produce a daughter cell, an internal daughter cell. With metabacterium, we saw uh, uh, an additional modification where the cell, instead of just dividing at one pole, it divides at both poles to allow for the production of multiple four spores. So I, I really don't have time to go into all of the data that supports this model, but this is what the metabacterium life cycle looks like. It's very different from, from Bacillus subtilis, where binary fission is almost a vestige and it can actually be bypassed altogether where we've seen cells emerging from their spore coats that have immediately started to sporulate and appear to bypass any vegetative division cycle. As I said earlier, the cell divides at both poles producing two four spores that then are competent to undergo division, producing multiple four spores that mature into multiple endospores. We think that this is an important means of reproduction that allows metabacterium to produce a dormant, highly resistant cell type that allows it to cycle in and out of its host's gastrointestinal tract. It can then survive being, this is, metabacterium is a strict anaerobe, it can survive being outside in an oxygen-rich environment and also survive passage through the, the upper GI tract of its host. So metabacterium constantly cycles in and out of its host's GI tract. For Epilopysium, we've studied development primarily in the B morphotype that I mentioned earlier and its host fish, Nasotonganus. One of the reasons we've chosen the B morphotype to study is that populations of this microbe in the gut are genetically much more homogeneous than any other epilopopulations that we've, we've looked at so far. It's also a really wonderful cell that's amenable to uh, immunolocalization and so we've used it for a lot of our cell biological studies. Again, I don't have time to go into the, the details of the data that goes into this, this life cycle, but based on a lot of data, we've, we've been able to piece together the Epilopysium life cycle, which is shown here. And you can see that what's missing is binary fission. We've never seen any evidence that Epilopysium type B undergoes the traditional form of binary fission. And instead, it relies on this polar, extreme polar division, engulfment of that polar cell, and growth of that internal offspring as its sole means of reproduction. We also have never seen any evidence of endospore formation in Epilopysium type B. We, we don't see phase-bright offspring being produced that are, are true endospores. And we think that, that that drive to produce a dormant offspring has been relaxed in these populations because it appears that resident populations are established pretty early on in the life of a, of a nasotonganus, and those populations are maintained throughout the life of the fish. So they may not need to make that dormant cell. I certainly don't have time to go into this analysis, but I, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about some work we've been doing with the Epilopysium genome. 
we've been looking for evidence in the genome of type B to see if there are any sporulation genes that are conserved in the genome that may be functioning in internal offspring formation. So we went back to our, our touchstone, our, our huge amount of foundational information from Bacillus subtilis, where we know that there are 700 plus genes in the Bacillus subtilis genome that are differentially regulated as Bacillus subtilis enters sporulation and goes through this developmental process. We looked at the conservation of these genes in other known spore former genomes, eliminated all of the the genes that are known to have some kind of a vegetative function, and specifically focused on genes that have a sporulation function. Of that 700 genes, um, this was work done by Dave Miller in my lab, Dave was able to whittle down that list to about 150 genes that are highly conserved in spore-forming bacteria that are specific for sporulation, and he found that only a small subset of those genes were conserved in Epulopiceum the genes that were conserved were involved in these early stages of asymmetric division um, and engulfment of the four spore. He found fewer and fewer genes that are required for making a highly dormant and highly resistant cell type. Fewer of those were conserved in Epilopiceum. So, so far we're gathering evidence that supporting this model that live internal offspring that are produced in Epilopiceum that process evolved from endospore formation. This actually might be a good time for us to stop, and um, I'd like to take any questions you might have on the, that introductory material before I get into the next stage of the talk, where I'm going to focus more on large cell size and, and bacteria, large bacteria. Thanks, Esther. So we can do questions through Twitter or through chat, or you can unmute your mic. Did we hear that? Questions through Twitter, chat, or unmute your mic are options for questions. Um. Well, one of my general questions, I guess, because I was fascinated that guinea pigs might have, you know, these large symbionts also is, do we have any idea about large symbionts in terms of gut structures and how abundant they are or frequent in terms of animals? You know, I think the, um, the gut environment is, is one of those new frontiers and people are certainly looking at diverse guts and um, with molecular methods, I'm not sure how often people are looking just using microscopy. So I, I think they're out there. There's um, an older paper that was published in the late 80s where a group of biologists saw metabacterium-like like bacteria in um, some of their rodent colonies, and they said, oh, I wonder how prevalent these are. And so they started looking at some exotic uh, rodents, and they found metabacteria-like cells in... Um, the pacas and capybaras and, and quite a variety of rodents and they all had this similar characteristic of being these fairly conspicuous cells that are fairly large that produce multiple endospores. So you know for a microbiologist who uses a phase contrast microscope all the time I would think wow these must be like like I don't know fireworks you know <laughs> how could you miss them but I think we're still discovering microbial diversity. You know, we're still discovering really surprising and diverse organisms that are, are practically under our nose. So um, there is a, a bit of literature from the older, you know, like the 50s, that describes large bacteria in a variety of different GI tracts, but they really haven't been studied beyond just their morphology. So we have two more questions. I have a question, but I'll first ask a question from the internet that came in from Denmark, presuming Ian's at home. Um, so Ian Marshall from Bo Jorgensen's lab would like to know, how about large bacteria in the human gut? What's the largest bacterium in there? Oh, wow, that's a great question, and I don't know that I can answer that. I've never seen oh, one, one of those... When you're a graduate student, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. When you're a graduate student, you kind of have time to chase really crazy ideas. 
And so one of the really crazy ideas was, can we find epilos in other systems like maybe humans? Um, it, getting human gut samples at the time was kind of challenging for us. Um, I don't know that anybody has ever seen large bacteria in the guts of humans, although we do see a lot of um, members of the Lachnosporaceae, which is um, where Epulopiceum falls. So I don't think there are any exceptionally large bacteria in the guts of humans. So they're probably all ranging about you know the normal bacterial size from less than a micron in length or in diameter to just a few microns, maybe five microns in length. Okay, so Caleb has asked, is there any idea how the tear in the envelope of the mother cell is repaired? Is it a directed process or more general stress response? That's also a great question. I, I And I've gone through this introductory material so fast that really important details sometimes I skip over. This is a terminal process. When the mother cell lyses and the offspring are released, the mother cell is dead. What you're left with is this husk of the, the envelope of the mother cell. Um, we actually think that the mother cell goes through a programmed cell death at the terminal, kind of at the end stages of daughter cell development. The most obvious change that we see is DNA in the mother cell diminishes. So we think that the DNA is being broken down and maybe shuttled into the, the developing offspring as either oligos or nucleotides that can be used for, for growth and development of the offspring. So um, the mother cell is never repaired. It's killed in the process. OK, and then uh, oh, we've got another question that came in. Has anyone sequenced the genome? Uh, what insights has it given us as far as their metabolism uh, was in terms of a host? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I guess the question is, uh, are there any metabolisms that have a connectivity with the host uh, in terms of the processing uh, of the fish, like fish gut metabolism? Yeah, that's a. We've we've been working on the Epulopiceum type B genome. It's still fragmentary, but we have a really reasonably good draft. It's in um, about 60 contigs right now. One of the, the big features in the Epulopiceum genome that is that it codes for a lot of polysaccharide degrading enzymes, and those polysaccharides are, are polysaccharides that you would see in algae that the fish is consuming. So things like laminarinases are coded for in the genome and other polysaccharide degrading enzymes. So we think that epulose are, are breaking down these polysaccharides that otherwise would just pass through the gut of the, the surgeon fish if it weren't for microbial um, degradation of those polysaccharides. The simple sugars are then fermented into volatile fatty acids and there have been uh, studies that showed that those volatile fatty acids, things like acetate, are taken up by the fish and used for um, energy, as a source of energy. We're currently working on a, um, a project to look at nitrogen metabolism, and we think that epulose might be a, an interesting model for allowing a symbiotic population to live in the gut of a host, but periodically lyse part of its cell whenever the mother cell lyses and release some nutrients into the gut lumen that may be taken up and used by the fish. So we think that, that the regular, the daily lysis of the Epulopiceum mother cell might be a mechanism that releases proteins or possibly some nucleic acids, some organic nitrogen sources that the fish or other microbes in the gut can, be use, can use. Okay, and then I have to just ask before yeah. you finish, but I might get distracted, I might distract you with this question, but uh, we are hearing about gut studies ad nauseum right now. Yeah. But they're all fecal analysis of gut flora oh. um, for the majority of gut studies. And so what you're talking about is an actual gut, right? And you're saying that the fish doesn't lose its population throughout the fish's life cycle. Yes. So I was wondering, as a person who studies gut symbionts, how do you feel about this idea that you can do fecal analysis and backtrack to a gut community and 
what are we missing if we're not doing microscopy on human guts? I think it's hard to say what we're missing, but I, I, I know from fish guts, which are, you know, highly accessible because we can open up the fish, we can sacrifice the fish and start looking at different parts of the gut and looking at the populations of microbes in that gut. Um, like humans, we have lower densities of bacteria in the anterior gut, but those numbers increase as we go more posteriorly in, in a surgeon fish. We see populations coming and going, so there are regions of the gut where you find dense populations of epilos, you know, they're the most conspicuous, so they're kind of the easy ones to spot. If you, if you took a gut and laid it out from a, a surgeon fish that had epilos and you laid it out in a line um, on, your, on your desk about two-thirds away from the, the stomach, about two-thirds of the length away from the stomach going posteriorly is where you'd find really dense populations of epilos and then those numbers trail off as you get towards the towards the anus. So um, that's just one group of, of microorganisms. When we look at, at sequences, when we do community surveys, we see populations, and, and, and when we sample along the length of the gut, we see populations coming and going. So I think of the gut as a, a very dynamic continuum that is different in different regions. Certainly the microorganisms in those communities are seeing different environments and are doing different things. How that impacts the host, we may not be totally seeing the full picture in the anterior intestine of humans because we're, we're looking at fecal bacteria. Certainly that's where the colon is the, the densest populations and they're metabolically important, but we may not be seeing more subtle, smaller populations that predominate in the upper GI tract, the more interior portions. It's just harder to sample, you know? I oh, completely understand. I'm saying in the interest of time, why don't we hold questions for now and then we'll keep uh, talking for the seminar and we'll do questions after the end of the seminar. Sounds good. Okay, so let me, let me pick up here with, this is one of my favorite photos, uh, at least favorite for now. Um, you all recognize this is an Eppendorf tube and all of the little flakes that you see in this Eppendorf tube are epilose. So this is just a tube of epilose that have been picked out of the gut of Nasotongonus. Epilopysium, and even more so, this beautiful bacterium, Thiomargarita namibiensis, are enormous microorganisms. Thiomargarita was first described in 1999. Again, it's a, an organism that's out there, it's abundant in certain environments and it's highly conspicuous. The, the micrograph on the right, I should say that I pulled both of these micrographs off the web and, and they're both from Heidi Schultz Volt's lab. She was one of the original discoverers of, and, and, and people who described Thiomargarita. The micrograph on the right is probably just taken from um, a dissecting microscope looking at some sediment samples and, and these beautiful chains of cells that look like a string of pearls and then these enormous individuals, you can see the scale bar here is one millimeter. This is a, this guy's at least 500 microns long. You can see these cells with the naked eye and under the microscope they're quite beautiful. These spherical cells contain tiny spheres inside their cytoplasm that are sulfur granules and those sulfur granules reflect light which is why these, these look like a, a string of pearls and they give thiomargarita um, their name, the sulfur pearl of Namibia. So we've got these enormous bacteria. We, we've actually known about large bacteria for more than a hundred years. There are reports of large, either free-living microbes like Spirochaeta plicatilis, which I always slaughter its name, but large free-living spirochetes and also large gut microbes um, described in the literature more than a hundred years ago. But all of these large bacteria all sort of had a very similar um, cell structure that fit in our concept of what a bacterium should be. So all of these large bacteria, even though they could be several hundred microns in length, were no more than two microns in diameter. 
This allowed no part of the cytoplasm to be very far away from the external environment. So uh, let's back up for a second and, and think about bacteria and our concept of bacteria. We think of bacteria as being very simple cells, and if you look back in older textbooks and, and older literature, you might even see them described as bags of enzymes and nucleic acids. So they were, they were just considered disorganized, very simple cells. And because of their lack of intracellular organization, which became really obvious in the 50s when we started looking at thin sections using electron microscopy, we saw all this beautiful intracellular membrane structures and organelles in eukaryotic cells, but we didn't see this in bacteria. So we thought we knew everything we needed to know about the bacterium, that it was simple and disorganized. And because of that, it relies on diffusion to get nutrients from its environment and also to move biomolecules throughout the cytoplasm. Diffusion is a very efficient process to move a, 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 a molecule from point A to point B as long as point A and B are very close together, only a few microns at the most. You, you get almost instantaneous um, um, movement. But as you start increasing that distance, diffusion becomes more and more unreliable as a means of transporting molecules from point A to point B. So bacteria had to stay small so that they had a large surface area relative to their cell volume so that they could encounter nut nutrients and, and take them up and use them in an efficient process in a timely manner. So big bacteria all seem to fit in this by having very thin cytoplasm. Even thiomargarita, which is an amazing cell, 98% of its volume is taken up by a central fluid-filled vacuole. And the cytoplasm, the active cytoplasm where the DNA is, where enzymes are, is found in a thin layer just under the cytoplasmic membrane that's no more than two microns deep. Epilopysium seemed to be exceptional in that you could have active cytoplasm that could be as much as 20 microns away from the external environment. So we were really keenly interested in, in studying features of Epilopysium that may have been modified or maybe even invented to allow it to support this large cytoplasmic volume relative to the surface area. You can get some hints by looking at electron micrographs of large epilos. This is a micrograph that we published some time ago um, showing a cross-section through a tiny portion of the mother cell. To orient you, this is the envelope of the mother cell. This is exterior of the cell and interior. One of the most striking features whenever you look at EMs of epilos is this highly enfolded internal membrane system. We think that that's important and it essentially increases the, the, the membrane surface area of the cell by just having lots of invaginations that we think are probably sites for transport proteins to facilitate movement of molecules in and out of the cell. Just beneath the cytoplasmic membrane is this layer of nucleoids, which is going to be the, the feature that we'll talk about the most in just a few minutes. Outside of the cell, you can see this this layer of broken filaments. This large structure here is a more typical bacterium that's stuck in the, in the um, layer of flagella that are on the surface of Epilopysium. We think flagella might also play a role in allowing this cell to be so big. I'm going to show you another um, one of these movies down an eyepiece, taken down an eyepiece, of some of the J morphotype epilos that you can see lying here under a, a microscope uh, cover slip, um, between a cover slip and a slide. Um, so they're kind of stuck, but their flagella are still beating. And you can see that they're causing a lot of turbulence in the, the surrounding environment. We think that this might be important for epilopysium, and, and they use their flagella, similar to what some ciliates do, and they use it to refresh the immediate environment, which could help um, overcome relying solely on diffusion to move waste products away from the cell and to bring nutrients closer to the cell. So we're currently interested in studying this, but I don't have any really great data to show you at this time. 
But one thing that we do have a really good handle on is the DNA in epilopysium. This is a, a fluorescent micrograph of epilopysium stained with the DNA dye DAPI. So everything that you see in this, this micrograph that's blue is DNA. And I hope you can, now that you've seen epilos many times, you can tell that this is a, an epilopysium mother cell with two large offspring. Um, here's a single offspring and here's one with three. Um, also in this micrograph, since this was just total gut contents, you can see this fellow up here, which is a, a large ciliate that also inhabits the nasotonganus intestinal tract. This guy is called uh, Balantidium jocularum. And all of these little dots, prominent dots that you see here and down here, those are the nuclei of some flagellates that live in the GI tract. So comparing the amount of DNA in these large bacteria to the nuclei of ciliates and flagellates, you can, can see that there's a ton of DNA in an individual epilo. We estimated from doing some really simple experiments of just picking a number of cells, lysing them, and then extracting the total DNA and quantifying it, we know that large epilos like this with two large offspring cells contain on average about 250 picograms of DNA. For comparison, our humo human cells that are diploid contain about 6 picograms of DNA, and E. coli K12, its genome is about 4.6 femtograms of DNA. So the first question we had was, what is this DNA made of? Is it representing an enormous genome? Or is it something else? Is it maybe a bacterial sized genome that's there in lots and lots of copies? We were pretty sure that it wasn't just a, a, a tremendously large genome because we knew that during that initial polar division event, only a tiny portion of the DNA from a mother cell is partitioned into that newly formed offspring cell. So we figured that that this tiny amount of DNA was probably at least one, if not multiple, genome equivalents. We found that we could use quantitative PCR to, well, actually we could just use PCR. If we took an individual epilopysium cell, put it into a PCR tube, we found that we could amplify genes um, using PCR pretty readily. So we used this to our advantage and used quantitative PCR to enumerate gene copy numbers of specific gene targets in epilopysium cells. We targeted the extremes of, of size and development um, looking at two different populations of cells, large cells with large offspring. We also tried to enumerate um, gene copy number in small cells with small offspring. These are just a couple, again, DAPI stained cells representing those groups of, of those populations. The first gene that we focused in on was FTSC. FTSC is a, a gene that's important for producing a protein that serves as a scaffold for the cell division machinery to assemble on at the site of division. FTSC is normally found in a single copy per chromosome in most bacteria. There are a couple examples where there are two uh, paralogs of FTSC in a genome, but in low GC gram-positive bacteria, there's usually just one copy per genome. So when we targeted that, we found, oh, actually what we would do is we would take individual cells, take them out of the, the total gut contents, photograph them, and then take that individual, put it in a qPCR tube, and enumerate FTSC gene copy number. From the photograph, we could measure the length and the width of the cell, and from those measurements, we could estimate cell volume. We then plotted cell volume versus genome co or gene copy number for FTSC. The pink dots represent small cells um, with small offspring, and then these, these blue diamonds represent large cells. So each individual point is a single cell, where the volume and gene copy number have been um, plotted. And we see this pretty good linear relationship between cell volume and gene copy number. However, it also represents how much diversity we would see in a, in a single population of epilos, size diversity and also genome or gene copy diversity. 
what our ultimate goal was was to use quantitative PCR to try to figure out if individual single copy genes showed different proportions in an individual, which may indicate that regions of the genome were preferentially amplified. So we expanded our survey, again, using individual cells. Um, we looked at not only FTSC, but also DNAA, RecA, and we had the 16S ribosome RNA gene clone, so we looked at it as well. Unfortunately, we saw a heck of a lot of diversity in, in gene copy numbers for all of these markers. So it was hard to say whether or not portions of the genome were preferentially amplified. Instead, we took a different tack, and we took populations of cells, isolated them, extracted their DNA, and then enumerated these different single genome copy um, uh, markers in a fixed amount of genomic DNA. When we did this, we found that the gene copy numbers for the same amount of DNA extracted from epilopysium cell populations in large cells with large offspring, we essentially got very similar, statistically identical uh, numbers of each of these three single copy genes. When we looked at the DNA from small cells, we found that DNA A had a statistically significantly larger number of genome copies or gene copies than the other two markers, but that kind of made sense to us. DNA A is, in most bacteria, it's um, linked to the origin of replication. So you can imagine in these small cells that are actively re replicating their chromosome that you may have chromosomes that are partially replicated and DNAA might be more abundant because of those multiple origins of replication. What we concluded from this data is that it all supported a model that epilopysium is extremely polyploid and that it contains probably an approximately 4 megabase genome that is there in just tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of copies. This is another um, pair of micrographs that I really like because it, it gives you a, a three-dimensional sense of where the DNA is in epilopysium. These are a single DAPI stained cell, but a micrograph with a focal plane going through a medial section of the cell, and then this section is just under the, the cytoplasmic membrane. So you can see the DNA forms this network just under the cytoplasmic membrane that totally encases the cell. These polar structures are the start of the next round of offspring. Betsy Hutchison, who is a postdoc in my lab, has been using DNA fish to label origins of replication or probes that would light up origins of replication and also looking at um, comparing the localization of two different chromosomal regions in single epilopysium cells. I'm not going to talk a lot about this today, but I just wanted to show you this really beautiful micrograph where Betsy has labeled two different regions of the chromosome in green, uh, a green probe as well as a red probe. And I hope you can get a sense from this. This is actually a compile um, micrograph of multiple focal planes through the thickness of an epilopysium cell. And I hope you can get a sense whenever you look solely at the green markers or solely at the red markers that these chromosomes are fairly regularly placed around the periphery of the cell. And we think that this is an important adaptation that allows epilopysium to support such a large volume of cytoplasm. These genome copies, these chromosomes, are located just under the cytoplasmic membrane but throughout the periphery of the cell, which allows epilos to respond to environmental stimuli immediately. Instead of having a centralized nucleoid that you might see in, in most typical bacteria, um, if epilos had that, it would take such a long time for the, the signals detected on the surface of the cell for signaling to reach the, the nucleoid and then for genes being expressed and then those products diffusing back out to the periphery of the cytoplasm where they might be functioning. So we think being extremely polyploid is one of epilopysium's tricks. It's just taken the simple building blocks of this 
quote unquote simple cell and just amplified it to allow it to support a large cell size. This is um, again a DAPI stain of Epulopiceum and beside it is a photo, photograph that, um, that Verena Salman has taken of a thiomargarita cell. There's a, I've got to throw in a disclaimer here. This is a pretty small thiomargarita cell, but the reason we, we chose this small cell was that it, it gave a, a much better global picture of the DNA in a particular cell. And you can see that there are multiple nucleoids around, again, the periphery of the, the cell, and we think that, that thiomargarita has a very similar mechanism of, as epilopiceum, having lots and lots of nucleoids being highly polyploid, and that's one of the ways that it can also maintain its tremendous amount of cytoplasm. Just looking at this cell, you can see these are shown at the same magnification, almost the same magnification. I think that each of these nucleoids is probably multiple copies of the chromosome. Um, Verena is going to be coming to my lab later this year and, and we're going to start investigating chromosome copy number in, in thiomargarita cells. So stay tuned. I mentioned earlier that um, we think that the mother cell undergoes a programmed cell death as part of the developmental process. And I was highly interested in whether or not chromosomes in the mother cell were dismantled and then those nucleotides shuttled into the offspring cell um, as a source of, of um, building blocks to allow the cell to develop, to support the development of the, the internal offspring cell. So we looked into a, a variety of different methods to try to pulse label genetic material to see if we could um, chase it into different parts of the cell, from the mother cell specifically into the offspring. Um, at first we were thinking about using radioactivity, but that seemed like a, a really daunting task because um, radioactivity, using it out in a field station where they're not really set up to use radioactive substances seemed like a really huge barrier. So instead we turned to um, a reagent that's commonly used by eukaryotic cell biologists to label newly replicated DNA. And this reagent is called BRDU, bromodeoxyuridine. It's a nucleotide analog that is taken up by lots of different cell types, both eukaryotic cells and bacterial cells. It's taken up and incorporated, phosphorylated and incorporated into to replicating DNA very readily. But because it's got this bromide attached to it, it's um, got a great handle that you can use antibodies that will specifically identify um, bromodeoxyuridine incorporated into DNA. So we use this reagent. This was, this was work done by um, Becca Ward in my lab. Becca used BRDU to try to label epilopiceum cells in the field. One of her most successful experiments was looking at a population of cells that were about this stage of development where offspring cells had been formed and they had have started to grow within the mother cell. So at this stage of development, no additional offspring cells would be initiated. So Becca just simply pulse labeled these cells in the GI tract of a, of a surgeon fish with BRDU and then looked to see where replication was occurring. As we expected, we saw replication occurring in the DNA of offspring cells, but what was surprising to us was that replication was still occurring in the, the chromosome copies in the mother cell. And you can see that in this um, fluorescence micrograph showing the immunolocalization of BRDU in an epilopiceum cell. This was fascinating because we know that these chromosome copies are never going to be inherited by an offspring cell. So they're replicating, but they're not going to be inherited. We, we interpreted this result as being essential. It's essential for these cells to replicate these quote-unquote somatic genomes so that we have enough genomic material to support the metabolic needs of this mother cell that in turn is supporting the growth and, re and, and development of offspring cells. 
Becca did a similar analysis with um, Metabacterium polyspora where she labeled uh, Metabacterium cells in the gastrointestinal tract of guinea pigs and in this she almost saw the reverse localization pattern where developing four spores were taking up BRDU and incorporated the incorporating the analog into newly replicated chromosomes. So for this study, um, we interpreted this as representing active DNA replication throughout the sporulation process, which is in stark contrast to what we see in Bacillus subtilis, where it shuts down replication during sporulation. We think that this is important so that the cells can be loaded up with multiple chromosome copies that then can be partitioned into the developing four spores. And in Epulopycium, we saw this replication primarily in the mother cell. This may have just been due to um, first come, first served, where the BRDU was, was being transported into the mother cell and preferentially used because um, we really saw intense staining in the mother cell compared to the offspring. But we saw this really interesting aspect of, of somatic chromosomes being uh, replicated even though that they would never be inherited by an offspring cell. Okay, so extreme polyploidy. We think that it's important for epulos to be extremely polyploid because it allows them to maintain their metabolic activity to support this large, highly modal cell. It also allows them, this large cell size, allows them to maintain their position in the gut. We've clocked epulose, large epulose as, as swimming as fast as 400 microns per second, and we know that they migrate on a daily basis anteriorly at night so that they aren't um, um, eliminated from the gut, let's say it that way. We also noticed from some studies that we did looking at single cells and the, the genes in single cells that Epulopycium appears to be able to tolerate genomic defects that otherwise might prove to be lethal in a smaller bacterium. Specifically, we know that Epulopycium contains poly A tracts within coding regions that are longer than what's usually tolerated by DNA and RNA polymerases. Um, in essential genes like DNA A, we see poly A tracts that are 10 nucleotides in length which is a length that can't be really accurately read by polymerases very well. This is a very rare um, feature that seems to be um, found either in organisms that have found a mechanism to repair these defects or in highly polyploid organisms. We also think that being highly polyploid allows epulopycium to gain advantages that are normally only seen in eukaryotic cells and social microbes. I like to think of epulose as being almost like a colony of, of cells, tens of thousands of cells that just never separated, never divided from one another. Certainly being large is, is nice in an intestinal environment and, and probably allows you to avoid predation, but it doesn't totally allow you to avoid predation. This um, fellow over on the left hand side is a balantidium cell that has recently eaten an epulopycium cell. So you're not totally saved. Okay, just to summarize quickly, because I'm way over time, um, Epulopycium species, the smaller epulose, and Metabacterium polyspora are all intestinal symbionts. We think that it's a specific, mutually beneficial symbiotic association where the fish benefits because these microorganisms are aiding in the digestion of polysaccharides primarily. The symbiont probably benefits by living in a very predict predictable environment with regular access to nutrients, regular predictable access to nutrients. The production of intracellular offspring appears to be derived from endospore formation, and we're currently looking at uh, the genomes of epulopyceums to uh, epulopycium species to, to see how this process has been modified for different forms of reproductive strategies. Large cell size is supported by extreme polyploidy. Genome copies in, in Epulopycium have now taken on both somatic and germline roles, where about 1% of the chromosomes is passed on to offsprings, and that other 99% appears to, to perform um, the same role as, as our body cells, just to support 
um, this reproductive function and development of offspring. And finally, polyploidy is found in diverse bacteria. And so I'd like to throw this idea out at you that, that polyploidy is not quite so rare as people think it is. It's found, there are great examples of polyploid bacteria in many of the major phyla of bacteria. And I think that ploidy is, is a target for selection. In environments where nutrients may be more predictable, such as a gut environment, polyploidy may be the norm because nutrients are not limiting and, and polyploidy has advantages over just being um, uh, having a single copy of the chromosome. So then my final slide is just acknowledgments. Thanking longtime collaborators Kendall Clements, Howard Choate, Lynn Montgomery. Um, I want to thank Verena for, for giving me some really great micrographs and I'm looking forward to working with her in the future. And I'm just listing a number of the people in my lab, graduate students, postdocs who have who've, um, done a lot of the work with Epulopycium and, and provided some really amazing insights into the biology of this organism. Listed just a few current undergraduates in the lab. I want to thank the fish, of course, and um, my funding sources, which are the NSF and Cornell University. So with that, I'd like to take any questions you might have. And thank you for, for hanging in there with my technical difficulties. And, and um, yeah, I'll take any questions. All right. Well, as we wait for folks online to type in a, oh, am I actually talking? I never know how fast my microphone turns off. Okay. So uh, as we wait for folks to ask questions online, if anyone in the chat has a question, please turn on your microphone and ask it. Or you can type and I will try to read it. Um, there was a leftover question I guess I can ask for you. Um, has anyone looked at the guts of these fish compared to the fecal matter? And you mentioned that the fish actually moved during the day, so I'm guessing there might be more there than you had mentioned. Yeah, so very few. Um, there have been very few studies, and, and um, there have been some misinterpretations of what's in the fecal matter compared to what's in the gut. So some of the epulas that, I, that we're studying actively in the lab that I didn't talk about today are the smaller J morphotypes, those really long filamentous organisms, and also um, the C morphotype, which looks a lot like the D morphotype, but it produces a true endospore. The interesting thing about these populations that are found in both naso unicornis and naso literatus is that they form endospores, and they do this on a regular basis, where endospores are seen in the GI tract, but only seen at night. Um, when we look at fish, these fish, if we hold them in captivity, um, we find that overnight if they do defecate, you know, it's a little bit of an unusual situation because they're probably stressed out. They're sitting in, a, in an aquarium instead of being out in their little hidey holes in the reef and sleeping. Um, but if we collect their fecal material, we do see epilospores in their fecal material that they, they've shed overnight. So it kind of depends on the organism. We definitely see spore-forming epilos regularly in the feces of, of um, some surgeon fish. Nasotonganus, even though it's a great model system, it's a challenging model system because it's such a large open water fish it's hard to, to capture and, and maintain in aquaria. Surgeon fish get their name because they've got spines on their tails that um, are, are thought to be like surgeon's lancets. And so they're, they're kind of a difficult species to handle. And so a lot of, you may see them in aquaria, but a lot of times they're, they're captured as smaller fish and brought to the aquaria as, as small fish, then, and they may not have all of their epulas in their guts. So that was my very long-winded question or answer to the content of feces varies depending on what surgeon fish you're looking at and what time of day you collect those feces, and um, it may or may not well represent what's in the GI tract. All right. And another question was you mentioned the motility, and so is there an estimate for how many flagella these organisms would have? Oh, that's a great question, and I don't have a good answer for it because 
it's it's really challenging to count them. Um, flagella are kind of brittle; they easily break off, and so I I really haven't tried to fix cells and bring them back to the lab to do any quantitative measures by SEM or by TEM. We 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 really need to do some serial sectioning, I think, uh, to get a better sense of the cell structure and also the the flagellar arrangement. Um, I've not tried to estimate it, although I, I think I probably could from some of the published micrographs. There, I'm going to guess there are thousands easily, um, maybe maybe tens of thousands. All right. Any other one in the Hangout have any other questions or coming through the internet? I yeah. just think this has been fabulous, and I love the fact that you gave history and overview because I think a lot of us will use this as a teaching tool in the future. So I think Lizzie has a question. Yeah, I do. This is Lizzie Wilbanks from UC Davis. Thanks, Esther. This was awesome. It was really cool. Thanks. <laughs> um, I had a question. I was curious that you said they migrate every night. What do you think they're sensing to know when it's night? Um, do you have a sense from looking at the genome of any sort of sensors or chemotaxis or something like that that they might be using to cue in to different times when it's time to move? Yeah, absolutely. Epulos have a number of what look like methyl accepting chemotaxis proteins, so or at least type B does. Um, I had a, an undergraduate working on a project to try to bring those MCPs into a Bacillus subtilis to see if we could figure out what's, what the various MCPs might be sensing, but she graduated before we got that, that system up and running. Um, I'd really, I, that's a great question, and we're, we're currently heading into a project to start looking at what oscillates, what, what, um, Maybe the metabolome is. Maybe that's the, the sexy word to use. But we're interested in, in things like do volatile fatty acid concentrations ebb and flow during the day? That, and that represents you know, active fermentation maybe happening late in the day when the gut is full and then diminishing as the nutrients are, are fermented. Um, we're also interested in other chemicals that might be coming and going and and whether or not epulos are sensing those signals to maintain their position in the gut or to alter their metabolism. So that's an ongoing question, and I don't have a good answer for it. But we definitely know from the genome that there's that potential for epulos to use MCPs to chemotax. Awesome. Well, we'll stay tuned. <laughs> Thanks. All right, any other questions? All right, I don't see any, but I would like to thank Esther on behalf of, uh, of everyone watching. We had somewhere around 20 people in a real-time environment, and we will likely have more uh, watching the seminar afterwards in the recording. Nice, um, nice. And so, yes, it's been fabulous having everyone here. We'll do another talk. Uh, in two weeks, and because it is a, sorry, I'm clicking through things here, we have to do the appropriate seminar ending with the applause. I hope my double Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank, you. thank you, thank you, Esther, and uh, we will uh, see you guys in two weeks. All right. Thanks, everybody.